Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. In a busy day, we're gonna be hearing 13 bill related to parking and regulations. As you know, parking and regulation is related to congestions, it's related to it, everything, not only for drivers, but also for pedestrians, are also related in this case to animal rights. Eh, estamos aquí porque estamos conduciendo una audiencia de 13 proyectos de ley que buscan actualizar el sistema de parqueo de la ciudad de Nueva York y que busquen solución al congestionamiento que tenemos en las calles, pero también actualizar estas 13 leyes para hacer el parqueo de Nueva York más eficiente para todos. Good morning and welcome to this hearing of the City Council's Committee of Transportation. Annie Danis Rodriguez, the chair of the committee. One of the great things about chairing this committee are, broad number, are the broad numbers of transportation issues that fall within its jurisdiction and that we can review. Mass transit, congestion pricing, alternative side parking regulations, millimeters, traffic control device, speed cameras, bicycles, sidewalks, and others. This, the, this, this committee deals with many issues that affect the everyday life of New Yorkers. I'm proud of the work we have done over the past five years and that we will continue to do to improve the transportation infrastructure here in the city and the numerous transportation services that are offered to our residents. As you can see from today's agenda, we have a full plate before us. First, the committee will be conducting an oversight hearing on parking regulations in New York City. The city's parking regulations regulation play a vital role in vehicle movement and govern where they can stop, stand, and park. These regulations are in place to help ease the flow of traffic facilitate on a street parking, assist in the delivery of goods to businesses, and maintain our street clean. However, sometimes this regulation can become too burdensome or outdated. Many of them are all and must be modified, which is why we are here having this hearing today. It is my hope that during today's hearing, we will hear testimony from the administration, advocate, and various stakeholders on way we can continue to improve parking regulations and traffic flow in the city for vehicles and trucks, while at the same time, and the most important, maintaining our commitment to pedestrians and, and cyclists' safety. The committee will also be considering 14 pieces of legislation, two bills that I have sponsored related to munimeters. Intro number 325 related to rounding up parking time and won't allow a person purchasing time at a munimeter to pay only up to the last full unit of time before the end of the pay parking period. This will prevent a person from having to pay beyond the mandatory pay parking. People should only pay for the time that they use the parking, not more. In intro 334, will require DOT to create a mobile application or approve the use of a mobile application that would connect individuals so that they can exchange unused millimeter time. We will hear several bills related to alternative side parking restrictions. Intro number 370, sponsored by Council Member Salamanca, will suspend alternative side parking regulations on the Three Kings Day. As we have done it to celebrate other holidays, the Three Kings Day is important not only to the Puerto Ricans and the Latino community, but it should be important to everyone. Intro number 497, sponsored by Council Member Kut, will suspend attorney side parking regulations on Lunar New Year's Eve. The same support 
that I explained before to the Salamanca bills is the same understanding that I have for the uh, council member coup bills. We should also treat that particular day special for everyone. We will also hear several bills related to improving pedestrian safety. Intro number 206, sponsored by Council Member Matthew, will require DOT to install pedestrians come down displays at any in intersections where there is a photo enforced traffic violation system. And intro number 1142, sponsored by Council Member Constantinides, will require leading pedestrians in trouble signals, or LPILIs, at intersections adjacent to hospitals, libraries, schools, and senior centers. Additionally, we will hear bills related to sidewalks and a street space. Intro number 886, sponsored by Council Member Spinal, will require permit commercial establishments to place pet harbors in front of their businesses so that owners can leave their small pet unattended in a safe and closed shelter for a short period of time while they shop. Intro number 867, sponsored by Council Member Adams, will require DOT to review the street wheels in order to reevaluate street traffic flow designations and intro number 928, also sponsored by Council Member Adams, would require at least two corners of a street intersection to have the appropriate street name signal installed. Several bills related to commercial vehicles and truck deliveries, including intro 1140, also sponsored by Council Member Constantinides, would require DCAS to develop and of our deliberate plan and for that plan to be submitted to the mayor and the speaker of the council. Intro number 1010, sponsored by Council Member Miller, will, require, will increase the penalties for certain commercial vehicles that park overnight on residential streets. Intro number 1011, also sponsored by Council Member Miller, will reduce the maximum time Searching commercial vehicles may park to no more than 90 minutes. Finally, two bills related to parking fines and the adjudication of parking fines. Intro number 570, sponsored by Council Member Traeger, will, will waive, waive parking violations issued to motorists who park their cars in a spot that have illegal parking signs. Let me now recognize my colleagues who are here and with us today, Council Member uh, Ego, Ego uh, Ku Cabrera, Diaz Espinal, uh, Ross, Salamanca, and Constantinides. I now invite the sponsor to give opening statements on the bills. First, starting with council members, Salamanca. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Rodriguez, for holding today's oversight hearing on parking regulations in New York City. And good morning to our panelists. Um, New York City is one of the most diverse places in the world. You can find global cuisines in any borough, hear different languages spoken in every community, and celebrate your own traditions through religious and cultural holidays. One of the bills we'll be discussing today is Intro 370. I introduced Intro 370, which would suspend alternate site parking regulations on Three Kings Day, a Christian holiday widely celebrated by many Latino communities here in the city of New York every January 6th. For many of the Christian faith, the Christmas season officially ends on this day with parades, celebrations, and religious ceremonies taking place all over the five boroughs, especially in the Bronx and in Barrio. Just as the city recognizes a vast number of religious and cultural holidays and suspends alternate site parking, many in the Latino community request the same treatment. I and my 18 colleagues who co-sponsored this bill agree. 
I want to thank Chair Rodriguez again for holding today's hearing, especially well in advance of January 6, the next three Kings Day. I am hopeful that we can pass this bill prior to the celebration and send a message to the Christian and Latino communities that your celebrations matter and the city recognizes them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Let's hear now from Council Member Spinat. Th thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm speaking on intro 886, a bill I introduced that would allow pet harbors on the sidewalks of New York City streets. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, just a, uh, not too long ago, DOT actually issued an order to remove these dog safe uh, harbors. And in, in because of that move, we uh, are potentially hurting a small business that uh, has provided a new technology that I believe is an asset uh, to pet owners, but also small businesses across the city. So what my bill would do would actually uh, car carve out these pet harbors, as we have done in the past, to carve out other coin machines, so uh, to ensure that New Yorkers uh, can, can um, you know, live a, a, a live in our city, knowing that there are these conveniences for them and their pets moving forward. I do have some questions, and I won't be able to stay here for the rest of the hearing. But you know, my questions are: one, why why does DOT uh, feel that pet harbors are any different than any other uh, coin machine in our streets? Um, and and two, you know, why are we setting an example where? we are not being open to the idea of new um, businesses, new technology uh, actually paving the way for how our city should move forward. Why are we putting laws in place that would um, get in the way of these businesses to be able to expand our city? Thank you. Okay, let's hear now from, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Kuhn. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, today I am introducing a four, uh, intro 497, which is to uh, uh, amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to suspending alternate side parking uh, regulations on Lunar New Year's Eve. Uh, we all know uh, Asian Americans has grown tremendously in the last 15, 20 years. Now we are kind of almost like 16 percent of the city population, and Lunar New Year is one of the uh, biggest holiday we celebrate. And of course, we don't just celebrate the New Year Day; uh, you celebrate the Eve before. Uh, you have a big dinner party, and people like to drink. So, so it's not wise um, not to suspend the alternate street uh, side parking because people in the holiday mood, uh, <coughs> uh, it's, hard, uh, it's not good to tell them, to, oh, you had to go out and move the car to the other side, you know? Uh, so I, I hope my colleagues and the, administrative, uh, and the administration will support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council members. I would like to welcome the representative of the administration who are here with us today Thank you for being here. I now ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite you to deliver your statement. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Operations, Joshua Benson, and with me today is Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack. Together with our colleague, Edward Grayson, Director of DSNY's Bureau of Cleaning and Collection, we are pleased to be here to testify on behalf of Mayor de Blasio on a number of bills before the Council on the issue of parking, as well as several other topics. I will begin with a little background on DOT's regulation of curbside parking in New York City and then discuss the bills before you today. With approximately 76 million linear feet of curb in New York City, DOT believes curb space is a shared public resource that should be managed to safely benefit multiple users, including local businesses, bus riders, pedestrians, bike riders, drivers, both visitors and residents alike. Proper curb management, the policies, programs, and regulations which dictate the functionality of this space is critical to allow the city to expand its travel choices, support business activity, manage congestion, improve neighbor neighborhood livability, reduce pollution, 
and enhance traffic and pedestrian safety. When it comes to parking, DOT has over 385,000 signs specifying who can park, when, where, and for how long. DOT maintains over 85,000 metered parking spaces, served by over 14,000 parking meters, and the Park NYC Pay by Sell program. As we testified back in June, we have accomplished two major transformations of our metered parking system in recent years, one of the largest in the world, through the transition to muni meters and the launch of Park NYC. DOT is now exploring a third transformation towards an integrated <clears throat> payment, electronic payment, license plate based electronic payment and permit management and enforcement solution. The rollout of Park NYC together with NYPD's ACES enforcement handhelds for their TEAs are potential first steps in this process, which would allow for much more efficient and fraud resistant parking enforcement. Since Park NYC became citywide in July 2017, usage has steadily increased to the point where now one in eight of the 2.3 million parking transactions in a typical week are handled by Park NYC, and usage continues to grow. Customers have reported that they strongly prefer the app to using the meters and find it far more convenient. They know about, use, and like the ability to extend their parking session from their smartphone. And we are happy to say that the data indicates relatively high satisfaction with the app overall. On the other hand, DOT is learning that users of the app want to park longer than the one or two hour limits currently allow posted uh, for most passenger parking and may be willing to pay progressively higher rates in order to do so. This is something we are trying with our regulations in Manhattan below 96th Street where we recently added a second higher priced hour to one hour metered parking zones to offer a little extra time for those who need it while still promoting curb availability. While some of the features proposed in today's bills are ones we could explore in the future, DOT is also actively seeking input from the public about how to make it more convenient for them to park and pay for parking using customer surveys to identify what improvements they would most like to see. In general, moving away from cash to, avert to virtual payments will lend greater flexibility. When it comes to innovation, another area we are focused on is our regulations, which have not always kept up with the ebbs and flows of New York City. Changing land use and population shifts and evolving neighborhoods and travel modes are putting added pressure on the curb. New regulations such as those for our car share pilot are one example of needed in innovation. But perhaps most glaringly, the structure of our metered parking rates for both passenger and commercial vehicles had not evolved very much as our city transformed. Incredibly diverse settings were served by similar regulations, providing little curbside management benefit to many areas that depend on meters to open up parking spaces for more people. Recent meter rate changes are one example of begin beginning an effort to more closely match the prevailing regulations with the current activity and needs of many areas of the city by creating a tiered approach. Finally, we know congestion is of concern to so many stakeholders, including, of course, this council. At DOT, we look to maximize the safe use of our shared street resources, including curbside parking to address congestion and best manage this limited resource in such a dense city. So that is why it is important for people to follow our parking regulations and why strong disincentives for not following those regulations are necessary. Now, beginning with intros 325 and 334, as DOT, including Commissioner Trottenberg, testified in 2014 and again in 2015 on predecessors to these two bills, we understand it can be frustrating to overpay for parking. I am pleased to report that one of the chief features of Park NYC is the ability to extend the parking session from your phone up to the legal limit. This allows users to pay for only the minimum time needed while retaining the ability to add time remotely if it becomes necessary to stay longer than expected. In practice, users report frequently taking advantage of this feature. <clears throat> Excuse me. Regarding the proposals before you today, 
a system for electronic exchange of unused time as proposed in intro 334 is not something we have in our current system and would be logistically complicated. This is particularly true because the unit being exchanged is not simply remaining value, but remaining time, which is constantly diminishing. On the other hand, the option to pay from your phone as you go addresses the issue the bill seeks to solve by providing users a means to not buy more time than they need. When it comes to the last increment of payment before meter's hours end and the occasional need to go over the metered time, the ability with Park NYC to pay as you go instead of in advance has reduced the occurrence of this as well. A system without the use of cash would no longer require the use of increments, perhaps a solution to the issue in certain areas in the future. Back when we testified in 2014, we produced some estimates of the actual amount of this type of overpaying. Of the amount that does occur, the majority is in the commercial environment. For passenger parking, updated for 2018, the amount is approximately $35,000 of overpayment for all transactions annually, or a figure equal to about 0.0008% of the payments we process in a typical week. On the other hand, the proposed solution would be an amount into the millions of dollars to absolve all parkers of the last increment of a meter's posted time. <clears throat> in partnership with the council, DOT took the major step starting in 2013 of ensuring that meters are switched off and cannot accept payment outside the hours they are in effect. While this may sound straightforward, it was actually complicated on a programming level and with a meter system as large as ours, the cost to implement was significant. We also implemented the ability to prepay before the start of meter hours so that you can pay for time up to the legal limit starting when the regulations begin. Previously, if you arrived before a regulation started and you wanted to pay for metered parking starting when the regulation began, you were forced to pay for the time before the regulation, in addition, in order to park. These two steps eradicated the vast majority of overpayment issues faced by customers. Regarding both the bills today, reprogramming the existing system to meet these requirements would be costly and would take time to implement while providing a very small benefit. So DOT does not support either piece of legislation at the current time. But we look forward to continuing discussions about what we are learning customers want and making additional enhancements in the future for both customer satisfaction and to best manage our curb for the purposes I have mentioned. Next, I will speak about intro 570, which would waive parking violations when a single parking sign is illegible. Our durable, high quality signage has an average life cycle of 10 years. And accordingly, last year we installed 138,975 signs, or about 10% of our stock, and over 135,000 signs the year before. DOT operates the largest, largest municipal sign shop in the country to support the continual maintenance of our signs. As background, over recent years, DOT has undertaken an effort to update our signage and reduce the clutter of excessive signage. In replacing old signage with the current standards that will provide more legibility and better lifespan, we have focused on areas that we believe have a higher percentage of signs that are at or beyond their useful life. Overall, the public does a very good job of reporting signs that need replacing. And in the case of alternate side parking, our single largest category of parking regulatory signs, DSNY notifies us when a sign is faded or has gone missing. On most block faces, there are multiple signs which display the parking regulation. When someone wishing to park encounters a faded sign, it is usually as simple as looking up and down the block for the next sign to confirm whether parking is legal. It is DOT's understanding that in the case of a missing, faded, or defaced sign, the enforcement agent shall determine if there is sufficient parking guidance on the block and only then issue the violation. As New York City traffic rules state, one authorized regulatory sign anywhere on a block is sufficient notice of restrictions in effect on that block. Finally, while the proposal may be conceived to further incentivize DOT to replace illegible parking signage, were it, were it to be enacted, it might in fact result in more motorists 
defacing signs so that they can illegal, park illegally without consequence, only leading to further confusion of the current parking regulations. For these reasons, DOT opposes intro 570 while we encourage motorists to follow posted regulations that apply. <clears throat> Next, on the topic of truck parking, this administration recognizes that truck parking overnight and in residential areas is a significant issue. While the proposed pieces of legislation, intros 1010 and 1011, requires further discussion, we are exploring charges that are available to more frequently enforce higher fines than are currently being used and are working with NYPD to determine the feasibility. At the same time, the need for truck parking in the five boroughs is a reality and continued efforts involving multiple city agencies to identify new options or sites are necessary. Now, moving on to the topic of leading pedestrian intervals or LPIs. Intro 1142 would require DOT to install at least 400 LPIs annually at signalized intersections adjacent to hospitals, schools, and senior centers until all such intersections have re received an LPI. On behalf of DOT, we strongly appreciate the Council's interest in the aggressive implementation of this proven safety measure. We have installed 2,774 LPIs since the start of Vision Zero, including 855 last year. To put this in context, since Vision Zero started, installations are up by 5,000%. In fact, we are hitting more than double our goal every year. We prioritize placement at high crash intersections and corridors. While we do consider locations such as schools, DOT believes the implementation of this treatment is best guided by the safety data and our engineering judgment, and we therefore target Vision Zero priority corridors. We are always happy to look at requests for specific locations as well. But requiring DOT to follow a formula to target locations next to specific facilities for 400 installations annually could replace a, at least some other higher crash locations that we would select. And having to follow such a formula could affect our overall efficiency as well that allows us to install such high numbers of LPIs in recent years, a key Vision Zero accomplishment which we plan to continue. Therefore, DOT opposes the bill as drafted. Now, turning to intro 206, which would require DOT to install a pedestrian countdown display at every location with a red light camera. Pedestrian countdown displays provide a proven safety benefit to pedestrians. As DOT has testified previously, more than half of all the cities over 14,000 signalized intersections have a countdown display, and we have plans to install more. When it comes to intersections that have been chosen based on safety data for installation of a red light camera, we reviewed those locations, and currently close to two-thirds have a pedestrian countdown display as well. DOT will assess the remaining locations for possible countdown display installation based on our engineering judgment and specifications. Regarding intro 928, this proposal would require no fewer than two diagonally opposite corners on each street intersection to have a street name sign for each street. This is the goal of all our intersections, and it is the standard we are meeting when we replace approximately 12,000 to 13,000 street name signs each year across the city. However, meeting the, requi the requirements for all the intersections citywide within 180 days of enactment as required by the bill would be a significant challenge to our resources and would divert efforts from vital safety work. Therefore, DOT opposes the bill. Regarding intro 867, this proposal would require DOT to assess every street in the city to determine whether to change its one-way or two-way designation. Conversions to one-way are in our Vision Zero toolkit as part of our street improvement projects. Such assessments are appropriately guided by our data-driven approach for safety improvements or by community interest. However, assessing all of our 6,000 miles of street in New York City for whether they should have one-way or two-way traffic flow is not an appropriate targeting of our resources. Therefore, while we are happy to further discuss the topic of conversions, including how to identify the streets on which to focus, DOT opposes this bill. 
regarding intro 886 to permit pet harbors to be placed in front of commercial establishments modeled on an existing law for coin operated rides which dates back to at least the 1980s as you know our city has grown significantly so have the demands placed on our sidewalks to accommodate larger numbers of pedestrians and our focus on accessibility for persons with with disabilities has never been greater DOT does not support this use of the sidewalk in light of population growth, accessibility needs, and other potential uses of the sidewalk space. In addition to DOT's purview, other city agencies have potential concerns and are in the process of reviewing this legislation. Regarding intros 497 and 370 to add additional holidays to the ASP calendar, DSNY has testified on similar legislation in the past and remains opposed. These bills eliminate two additional days of alternate side parking during the year, in addition to the existing 34 alternate side parking holidays that are already in place, some of which are for multiple days. DSNY believes that their street sweeping vehicles are the most effective tool in the city's street cleaning arsenal, and further reductions in street cleaning regulations would limit the effectiveness of this tool. We at DOT refer additional questions about these bills to them. Finally, regarding intro 1140, promoting off-hour deliveries is an important tool to reduce congestion and emissions. DOT's off-hour deliveries program focuses on shifting truck deliveries from peak periods to off-hours in conjunction <clears throat> in, specific in specific congested areas such as Midtown Manhattan, Downtown Brooklyn, Flushing, and Jamaica. We conduct targeted outreach to business locations and also work with transporters and receivers to facilitate curbside access needed to support such deliveries. The bill before the committee today is a worthwhile proposal that this administration, including DCAS and DOT, would be happy to explore further before possibly implementing a plan. Challenges to off-hour delivery can include the transporter's ability to service off-hour deliveries, the availability of secure drop-off facilities, the potential for refrigeration, if needed, and other logistics. DOT has already initiated an assessment of deliveries to DOT facilities to examine opportunities for improving freight efficiency. I will finish by saying that with so much density of people and activity, we all know competition is very fierce for the many uses of street and sidewalk in New York City. At DOT, we are continually improving and innovating how we manage this valuable resource safely and efficiently for the greatest benefit while balancing all of those competing uses. Regarding some of our other signal and street treatments we are discussing today, DOT welcomes conversation with the council about how we utilize all the tools in our toolkit. And as I have said, we are always happy to review a particular location. We would now welcome any questions. I will have some question, but uh, my colleague, council member Salamanca, had to go to the Bronx, so I will let him to go first. But of course, I I appreciate that you got from DOT sanitation is here. I'm a little bit frustrated that there's no one from traffic, and I hope that I, you know that an issue that has many bills related to traffic. I know that from the DOT perspective, you can answer some of the question, but it doesn't make sense that no one is here from traffic enforcement to be able to respond to some of the questions. Uh, Council Member Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Um, thank you for your, for your statement. Um, I'm, I'm, my, my question is really, you may think I'm going off topic, but I'm gonna circle it back uh, to, my, uh, to, my, to my statement or the, the reason for my bill, which is um, intro 370. Uh, which would require that Three Kings Day, uh, on Three Kings Day, alternate side parking be uh, suspended. And as I stated in my statement, you know, this, this uh, holiday, it's, um, it's a holiday that's celebrated by, by the Christian and Latino communities. Uh, but yet in your, um, in your statement, DOT, because this is your statement, there was no statement by sanitation, you're opposed to it. I have a question. Can you explain to me the diversity in your leadership? I am interested in knowing who in DOT will be opposed to canceling alternate site parking 
on a holiday that's highly respected and celebrated by the Latino community, yet you feel that it's not necessary to cancel Old Tennessee parking. So can you explain to me, how many Hispanics do you have um, in the leadership in, 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 um, in DLT? Council member, I appreciate the question and I definitely understand the importance of the holiday. And the, the statement that I read um, is about cleaning and it, it comes from DSNY, so I'm gonna defer the, the question to- uh, No, I, I understand that, but I'm just curious DSNY. because the Department, of, of the Department of Transportation sent you to come and give a statement here in City Hall. I would like you to tell me how many leaders, how many Hispanic leaders are there in the Department of Transportation? Councilmember, I can get back to you with information. We don't know that exactly. You don't. You have no idea how many Hispanic I, leaders there are in the Department of Transportation. Yet you want to sit here and tell us that a holiday that's highly respected by the Hispanic community cannot get an alternate site parking suspended. We. I, I just want to clarify one thing. We were uh, because there's so many bills, and it's just only a couple bills for DSNY. We were including their testimony in our testimony. So be a little more streamlined effect. We don't oppose the bill. We were speaking on behalf of- Well, your statement says that you are I, not supporting the bill, so therefore you're opposing the bill. I think we were, we could have clarified that a little bit better on behalf of DSNY, the op is the opposition. So you do not know how many either, Hispanic leaders you have in the Department of Transportation? I don't know that off the okay. top of my head. Okay, all right, sorry. And, and, and let I'm me- I'm sorry, Mr. Let Chair. Let me, yes, interject with this. You know, everyone live with the pride of the, the group that we come from and make this city a great place. The Jewish, the Italians, the Irish, the Afro-American, Latinos, black, and others. There's a reality here. I don't think that many people even know that in the 1900 census, the New York City population was 96% white. 2% of American Latino were not counting. Today's population is 29% Latino, 27% of American. Together in the 15% nation, we made the largest group here. Based on Angelo Falcon, who unfortunately died, a great academic, and I don't think that anything has changed, I do give credit for some improvement that we have seen in the city. But no doubt that was Council Member Salamanca is bringing, and it's so connected with the bill that I fully support, and I hope that we can work together because it's important, should be important for everyone. This is important to the second largest group of, of, of New Yorkers in the city. And adding to the question, there's a reality. There's 10,000 leadership positions in the city of New York, and there's only 200 Latino in leadership position. So yes, we are lacking that fair share of representation in government, academic, media, and no places. And that's why when we have any hearing here, you're only gonna see a lack of Latinos sitting there representing us. And I think as the Afro-American community have been very efficient making the cases, anytime that there's a panels and there's no representation of the Afro-American community, they speak loud and clear, and we are in solidarity with the call. But it is our time to, to say, where is our Latino seat in all agencies? So the reality is that, no, there's not Latino fair representation in any agency of the city of New York, and that's why probably there's a lack of understanding on how important it is to work in this bill, not only for Puerto Ricans or Dominicans, but for all Latinos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question to sanitation. Um, how many Latino leaders do you have in the leadership in the Department of Sanitation? No, is it? Uh, good morning. Um, my boss, the first deputy commissioner, is a Latino. Uh, we have a couple of chiefs that are Latino. So we have Latinos at the upper ranks in sanitation. I don't have an exact number to give you, but I report directly to a Latino leader every day. That's awesome. Um, so uh, can you explain to me why would the Department of Sanitation be opposed uh, to a highly respected holiday in the Latino community? Um, we're not opposed to uh, the- Alternate side parking, canceling of the- No, no, we're, we're, we're opposed to canceling of alternate side parking. We are not opposed to it because of the catalyst event. Our job, our core mission is to keep the streets clean. 
We work very hard to try to do that. Our most effective tool in keeping New York City clean for all New Yorkers, regardless of race and denomination, is our most effective tool is mechanical brooms. In order for those to that tool to be effective, we need the ASP regulations in effect. So we oppose anything that takes a day away from us being able to clean up. That, that's what we're opposed to, not, not the cause, not the requester's cause, just the fact that we can't get the street clean every time the suspensions are lifted. So thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, again, I really thank you for your support, and I want to thank my 18 uh, colleagues who have signed on to this bill. When you look at the 34 days of alternate site parking that has been suspended, you know, you have a various, um, for, uh, they're suspended for various religious uh, reasons, um, and I just feel that the, um, that the uh, three, day, three Kings Day uh, is also a holiday that should be considered as a 35th uh, day uh, to suspend alternate site parking. With that, thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me ask you a question. First of all, we appreciate the work that men and women do in sanitation, keeping our city uh, clean, picking our garbage, and, and, and this is something that we've been working and the council have been showing by every year. Uh, uh, we're negotiating the administration with no funding for you guys to be able to keep our, picking out the, our garbage. So, however, yes, by adding important holidays, and as we also doing other, suspending other days, it doesn't mean that we are adding a, a, a more to the issues on how the street cannot, you guys cannot be doing the work. This is about, as we have done with other holidays, we feel that these two particular ones, especially so critical, especially for for the Latino and the Asian community. How many, I have a few questions now, how many tickets uh, were given last year because of traffic violation? Council member, we, um, we don't have the, uh, the, the parking violation data with us. We could certainly get that back to you. And again, very proud of the work that we have done it, and we will continue doing it as a DOT. But we don't have the answer because there's no one here from traffic. And we ask for you guys, the administration should know, not just that particular agency, but the administration as a whole, that a hearing we have all those many bills should be sure that everyone for the agency that could provide those questions, they should be here. Uh, Do you know like how many, we talk about the importance to update the street signal in New York City, like how many, do you know like how many signal uh, uh, do we have right now that they should be updated? Can you um, clarify the question a little bit? We have, four, we have 14,000 traffic signals, tra tra intersections with traffic signals. Yeah. What do you mean by updating them? Yeah, fire drive that, that they are not working anymore, that is still people are getting tickier because they are not used anymore. And it's still the city has not updated those situations. Uh, Churches that they used to be open. Oh, you movies, mean the, the parking signs, yeah, not the a parking traffic sign, signal. Yeah. Because when a traffic signal is out, yeah. we dispatch emergency response like how many, to that. How, how, many, many, how many signs in total? Sign do you feel that should be? Parking signs yeah. are like defaced or mm -hmm. faded or whatever. I'm actually not sure. Yeah. So at, at any given moment, I don't think we know the number. What we do is we rely a lot on the, the public in particular and the council members, your, your constituents, to report any issues like that that they see. But we need to know because we are reaping New Yorkers their money. For, we're taking their money not as an individual as a particular agency. We as a city are taking money from the package of people. Like there's a movie theater, I can, and it's not enough to say, council member, please give you the information. Right. You know what I mean? Like right. why a movie theater used to be working at 181st and Broadway, and that movie's been closed for the last two years. And DOT, they don't get it, that, that part, no parking sign. 
should be removed immediately. As you know, not you as an as a institution, who every agency got a report that that movie theater is closed. That sign should be, if it's not in needed because of pedestrian safety, which I supported, why Park Terrace West? There's a fire drive that is not working anymore. And residents in Yingmore, they're getting ticket, and that's because we need the money to balance our budget. Why sanitation is continuing, like, you know, like, sometimes giving ticket in area, like, people sitting, waiting for the, and sweeping truck to pass by, and still giving those tickets when the driver, they just stay waiting to move the car. So when I look to those signs, my concern is, don't come and tell us only, give all the information. Because I can tell you, with the importance to allow the, the, the dog owners to be able to work with their business and establish, you know, the, the, the hybrid space in the front of the business. As you know, I'm all about sidewalk. I'm all about pedestrians and cyclists as a top priority. But for me, doesn't make sense, and everything is local, but what I can tell you my story is the same thing that I know many council members can tell you. A year ago, I told you guys, I show you a photo. San Nicolas Avenue between 180 and 181st. A business owner take 90% of the sidewalk plus the street, if you go right now, and you guys are not enforcing on someone who, and DOT has the information, traffic has that information, and say we work on, work on it. So when we have major issues of someone that is taking like 90% of the sidewalk, and you doing nothing, and all the data, even taking the street right now, if you go. And here there's an initiative or something that is part of the life of everyone in New Yorker to say, whoever on a dock, they should be able to put it in a location close to the business to have a dinner. So how can we balance, you know? How can you work with us to be sure that we go after those who violate, you know, every day? And I can tell you right now, cases, that's one as many that we know in many, that we have in many communities. People who are abusing, they use a the sidewalk. And we as a city are doing nothing. And then here we have a, idea, a suggestion, a bill, that is important for a large percentage of New Yorkers who own that, who say, how can we work? So how can we balance one? How can we execute and go after those who violate us? My case is the one that I told you, and I get information to you guys a year ago. And at the same time, work with something that is important for a large percentage of New Yorkers to, for them to allow to take the dog when they have a, a a brunch, when they have a dinner, when they have a coffee. You're, you're referencing the grocery store in your district, correct? Excuse that, me? The grocery store on St. Nicholas Avenue. That's St. Nicholas between. That's, right, the one, that's the one. And I think there would have been a, a multi-agency effort, I think also with DCA. What are we can waiting I, I, right, for? I, I know, can I, can I get more details from my borough office and follow up you with you You can, directly? but you have I, a year ago, I, I, many times, over and over. Understood. And anyone go right now and take a photo abusing the whole sidewalk and abusing the street, in both sides of the street. So one, work with me, work with us in cases where people are abusing, they are excessively using the sidewalk that they are not supposed to, they're supposed to have three feet. And then let's work with us with the bill, as we are many representatives of animal rights, who love the pet, who love the dog, and the council member here, and let's see how we can work around that bill. We're, we always enjoy working with you, council member, and I think we've made great strides in the past five years, so we welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. On sanitation, uh, how close do you work in coordination on, on, with traffic, with the traffic enforcement agency? Um, with with the NYPD traffic enforcement, mm -hmm. uh, they they are in there. Uh, they get, they get assigned agnostic to how we assign. So we do not we 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 are aware we do not summons any vehicle that they have already summoned. 
that is something that we completely, it's right there on the ticket, we, we bypass it because as, as it pertains only to street cleaning regulations, but yeah, we don't, we don't work, uh, we don't dispatch our assets around where they dispatch theirs. Okay, I, I, again, I, I'm all about supporting the sanitation department for you to be able to enforce the law so that you can be sure that we pick out the, the, the garbage and clean the street. Uh, I have issues sometimes with some agency that I feel that is still, even though it doesn't happen as before, I believe that still productivity is also mandated. And there's like a number of tickets that enforcement has to give every day. And that's why sometimes instead of only going for after those who violate the law, which we should, there's also cases or yes given ticket. And I'm not talking about yes sanitation, that's what I say. It's so sad that traffic is not here to respond to the question on how do they guarantee that they're working to go after those who violate the law, but at the same time not to abuse it. And yes given ticket at some time, they are yes given because they have to give a number of tickets every day. Do we think that we still use the productivity for, uh, uh, today where enforcement from traffic, uh, and I don't mention NYPD on traffic, they have to give a number of tickets every day? So, I'm sorry, could you say that again regarding NYPD traffic? Those, uh, and again, if you cannot answer because that's traffic, I'm fine with though. If you okay. can give me the question with someone, does the New York City traffic, pull NYPD enforcement traffic have to give a number of tickets every day. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. And my last thing is about congestions. I, it, and there's a lot of concern, and you hear from my colleague now in one minute or two about trying to work around being sure that commercial truck, they are not parking the residential to limit it. But that's also connected for me with it, it, Incentive, what incentive are we providing to the truck associations and all the members that work around them to be sure that they focus on delivering at night? Chairman, that's, it's an excellent question. And deliveries at night, um, you know, there's some, maybe they're not obvious to everybody, but there's some real congestion uh, benefits to deliveries at night. It's um, you know the traffic is is both lighter, so it's it's a benefit to the the person making the delivery that they're not sitting in delays, and then they're also by the you know flip side they're not contributing to the congestion during the the peak periods. Um, so at DOT we have an off-hour delivery program, and that consists of uh, doing outreach and demand management with both. Um, both uh, receivers of deliveries and transporters, and um, trying to work through their concerns and, and, and make a match where we can. Um, and it's difficult. There are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of, um, you know, there there are a lot of reasons why people take deliveries during the daytime. Quite frankly, and um, you know, uh, particularly on the the staffing side at the receiving site, uh, tends to be the biggest um, challenge. And so one of the things we, we try to encourage people is to look at lock boxes and other ways of, of securely receiving goods um, while no staff are present at the, at the facility. So, um, so th those are some of the things we work on. There are about 100 businesses right now uh, participating in the off-hour delivery uh, program at about 300 sites. Um, so it, you know, we, we're just trying to build on that momentum. I, I just feel that based on conversation that I have with the stakeholder from the Strong Aso Truck Association months ago, uh, there is a need for you know DOT and DICA to continue working close with them, so that as we approach those bills that we have here, and I understand that it's important to protect the residential area, but that also work we the members of the truck association to be sure that when, as we continue addressing congestion that is real, and this is our time to put together a comprehensive plan related to congestion, 
that those institutions who deliver food and other goods, that they also continue being engaged with DOT and DCAS to talk about incentive uh, and not only uh, on going after them. So that's one thing. My last thing is about my two bill. One is the, the, the one that is will rounding up parking time. I feel that people should pay only for the time that they park. If someone need to park for 50 minutes, they should be only paid for those 50 minutes. They should not be forced to pay for an hour. And I feel that the technology is there for, to make that happen. And I hope that we can continue conversation about the rounding, the rounding up. And I know that we have started uh, many times being an opposite side in some bills, in some initiatives. At the end of the day, through conversation, we decide to do things through legislation and as the agency, any agency, now in the future, in the past, we prefer to do more by themselves. But I feel that whatever way, through legislation or, or, or through the agency, the rounding up parking time is needed. Someone should not be paying more than what they're using the time. The second thing on the intro 334 that we require DOT to create mobile application or approve the use of mobile application that will connect individuals so that they can exchange and use millimeter time. Whoever pay is their time. It's not our time. And it's their money. And again, I remember coming back from DC when I introduced the bill that will ask mandate DOT to add to create the ad application. And we were able to work together with you guys. And we did it through the agency. One more time here, technology is there. Why you say that, that probably it, it, there's some complication how to do it? You will hear from many tech field that that's doable. That we should be able to work to allow exchange on use millimeter time. As a council member, as I've been told, there has been, there's bill that I have that I've been told by stakeholders and they say, look, if you pass this bill, the city will reduce $35 million because, you know, we will not be able to enforce in those areas. And I think that, yes, we will need this money to keep more library open, we we'll get more hours to the library. But this thing is, is about technologies is there, and how can we work with the tech field to be sure that if you have any doubt on how that can be addressed, that we can work on that bill. Mr. Chairman, I, I agree that you know we have uh, a lot of great ideas um, on the tech side that could make some of this possible, and I think we we absolutely want to keep working with you and keep refining. Um, our Park NYC app, you know, it's, uh, we, we just, you know, launched it now only two years ago, and I think um, absolutely we don't see this as it's not perfect, it's not the, the end state. We want to keep refining it and working on it, so we'd be ha more than happy to work with you on delivering some more uh, benefits to the, the customers and, and finding ways to eliminate, you know, further eliminate any overpayment that may be happening. Okay, thank you. Council Member, I would like to acknowledge that Council Member Reynoso, Miller, Levin, Dodge, and Levin, they are, they were here, and now going to question in five minutes, Council Member Cook. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners and, 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 and Director. So my question is, uh, I'm, I'm very disappointed that the administration is opposing uh, the bill 497 and 370, because uh, we always said this is a city of diversity with uh, celebrate culture and ethics uh, heritage for every uh, group of people in the city. So my question is, you, know, you said you will make the street dirty if you put two more days on the schedule. So what does you do on, on, on a particular day of uh, sweep, sweep, sweeping? alternate side street of uh, Kenning. What does center station do? On that, uh, at that particular hour or two hours that you cannot park the, uh, on, on the street, right? 
Yes, so you're asking, just so I'm clear, you're asking what do we do on the days yeah, yeah, that it is suspended? Yeah. Well, the, the mechanical rooms um, will still go out in a limited number to get, because there, uh, there are some open curb lines, regardless, they, they're not directly ASP driven that we also clean. Uh, so we will put them out to add some level of service, but the routing of our regular posted signage, those regulations, does not get completed on any day that it's suspended. So when, when we celebrate a holiday, it's, uh, particularly the like Asian uh, Lunar New Year or the Lunar New Year Eve, we, we don't have a parade. You know, the, sign, the streets are not dirty. You know, we won't make the streets more dirty. We celebrate at home or in the restaurants. So why does it affect the cleanliness of the streets? Uh, actually, you bring a very good point. It's not directly related to any holiday. Unfortunately, there is uh, litter in the city every day, regardless of holiday. And our mechanical brooms are our most effective tool to clean the city for all New Yorkers every time we run them. So it has, we're not saying that, our position is not that any holiday would impact direct brand new litter being put on the street. We have to clean the street every day to the best of our ability. Adding two more suspension days makes it more difficult for sanitation to do that. That is all. Yeah, but, but you already, uh, we already had 34 days, right, you said? Oh, that you don't 34, 34 reasons to suspend. Some of those are multiple. So like for calendar year 18, yeah. I believe it was like 40 or 41. So, so uh, what, I don't understand the significance, adding two more days there. Oh, well, I, because I mean, you don't what, clean the street. You, if you <laughs> already have a list of so many days, can you know the, all the days here? Do you yeah. know the, all the days? Can you uh, say out to me? Oh, well, sure. the holidays? Sure. I mean, it's not the holidays. It's a... No. I'm gladly. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Lincoln's birthday, Ash Wednesday, Asian Lunar New Year, uh, Washington's birthday, uh, a.k.a. President's Day, Purim, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Passover, the first and second days, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, um, I'm sorry, Solemnity of Ascension, Shavuot, uh, uh, Fidul Id Adir, Feast of Assumption, Idul Aha. Rosh Hashan, Yom Kippur, Sukkoth, uh, Shemzi, Azarath, Simchas Torah, Columbus Day, All Saints Day, Diwali, Election Day, Veterans Day, and uh, Thanksgiving, the Immaculate Conception, and Christmas. Yeah, I'm sure, and I, uh, I, we all respect all those holidays, right? I'm sure some of us don't recognize all those holidays. You don't, do you recognize all those holidays? What, what is the purpose of it? Well, I, I recognize them all. Yeah, They're on the couch. I don't. Yeah. I don't sweep the street. I'm do I? Do I personally celebrate all of them? Yeah. No, sir. I do not. So, so to me, the, the argument is that Flicking Days is a very important holiday for the Latinos, right? Uh, Asian New Year, New Year is a very important day for Asian Americans. So Correct. we want to include these two days uh, on on the list of alternate street side cleaning streets. So we want you to do it. If you don't want to do it, uh, our council will do it for you, right? Duly noted, sir. Yeah. And, and, and one more point is uh, for transportation. Like, uh, on the meter parking, I noticed in Flushing, uh, we had to pay meter until 10 p.m. But while in the city and in Forest Hill, in other parts of Queens, it's up to 7 p.m. So my constituents are always complaining to me, you know, we are being a like, single hour, be, being discriminated. Uh, in our area, we had to pay meters up to 11, uh, 10, 10 p.m. at least. So why is the discrepancy, you know? Council member, it's an excellent question, very astute um, question. So the, the metered hours uh, vary by location. They're not uniform across all five boroughs. Um, and places that tend to have more activity, more congestion, more customers, um, will tend to have longer meter parking hours. So, you know, I, I think Meatpacking District actually ha has the latest um, metered parking hours because there's a very late night activity there. So, um, but Flushing, um, downtown Flushing, as you well know, is a very busy area. It's a very popular area. Um, many people are, are driving there to uh, park and, you know, partake of the establishments there. So it, it reflects the activity. That's that's the purpose of it. and. The constituents are arguing that the city wants to do is just to get more money, you know, from from uh, from our district. So the the purpose behind it is to 
to turn that parking over and make it available for, for more customers. And you know, if, if there's a particular situation that you don't feel is working, uh, we would be happy to talk with you about it and we can make adjustments. Yeah, I think we have to discuss on those because in downtown uh, New York, it's up to 7 p.m. If you go to Manhattan, in the midtown, 7 p.m., they stop. Uh, it, it, it varies. There are definitely places in Midtown where it goes much later than that, um, near, near the theater district, that, you know, but we'd be happy to review any site with you and, okay. and, and look at it for sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I would like to reinforce what I said before when I, as I was addressing the importance and the support that I'm putting behind the three king days and the lunar uh, day. I don't think that the city, I, I believe that the city needs to create, we need to create task force to, or to revise all days that we observe and also to look at all the days that we should include it. Because I feel that I respect all the days that you're mentioning. And I join, I join, will continue join my celebration of those days. But I feel it's not on sanitation, it's we as a city. The city has not get it how we have changed. How there's a some group like the Asian is more like 17%. Latino is 29%. And I feel that in order for our children that we're raising right now, you don't have to be Asian or Latino to understand that piece. The piece of history, how we celebrate that. So my thing is it, it is it will be needed. And I will be working with my colleague. I already told my staff to put a LS request to create a task force to look at all the days, that, to revise all the days that also we should study and see if we should include those days and observe and allow them like as we have done it with other days. I would like to acknowledge Council Member Menchak and now Council Member Yeager and followed by Council Member Constantinides. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the Chairman, good morning. As the Chairman uh, indicated earlier, we're hearing 13 bills today designed to make it easier for people to live in New York, to do business in New York, to make it fairer, to make our streets safer, to recognize the various cultures and religious observances that people have in the city, to uh, rid our residential neighborhoods of commercial parking, to keep trucks off neighborhood streets, to do good things for New Yorkers, 13 bills. I listened to your testimony, I read it before you started speaking, and then I listened to every word you said. Not a single one of those 13 ideas are things you agree with, as currently written, not a single one. I don't agree with all 13 bills. I co-sponsor some of them, because I think they're great ideas, some of them I think are good ideas. Some of them I need to be convinced. But in a universe of 13, I was able to find at least one that I thought was a good idea that I could sign on to. You can't find a single idea in these 13 bills that you like. And that's not the only 13. Chairman Rodriguez has a bill that would allow people to reclaim their streets and their neighborhoods after the street sweepers have gone by. So in a 90 minute zone, when you can't park, and the street cleaner comes by in the first 10 minutes, the next 80 minutes go back to the community so people can park again. You oppose that. It's not being heard today, but you oppose that. There are a number of parking bills that are not being heard today that you oppose as well. So let's just talk about the universe of 13. Not a single one of these bills is something you can live with. Not a single one of these ideas is something you can say, you know what, council? You also got elected. You're here to serve the public. We'll agree with that. Some of these bills have the votes to pass. I'm not sure what it is that you really want from New Yorkers. I really don't. I really don't. I wake up every morning and I see some of the things that DOT does, some of the things that sanitation does. I, I appreciate that. You pick up the trash. I really do. But in my neighborhood on the border that I share with uh, Councilman Deutsch, we have, a, um, we have a commercial area and a residential area that has midnight to three regulation. Middle of the night. People can't park on one day a week on the other side of the street. You know, it alternates trying to get that removed and changed to a 7.30 to 8 a.m. or an 8 to 8.30 a.m. so people can park overnight. It's hard for people to park overnight. They find, I, I hunt for parking. Um, the Department of Sanitation opposes that. We don't have enough street sweepers, they say, to hit the streets from 7.30 to 8. 
It'll affect our ability to keep the streets clean. Nobody I know believes that. I, I don't even think your department believes that. But there's this resistance to change. The idea that you would oppose a bill that would require a summons to be dismissed if the sign is not legible because A, people can look up and down the block for the legible signs, B, because don't worry about it, New Yorkers, traffic agents only write tickets when the sign is very legible and otherwise they won't write a ticket. They only write good tickets, we all know that. And C, New Yorkers, you awful people, what we are, are gonna just go around with spray paint and start spraying up the signs. I mean, does this make sense? This is how our government is reacting to these ideas? In what universe does any of this make sense? I'm not even asking for a question. This is a reflection on what I've been hearing today. Parking NYC app, I, I use it. Um, when the time expires, even if there's more time that you're permitted to park there, you can't renew it. You, you have to wait about, I think it's 15 minutes or a half hour, even if you're still within that hour or two hour zone. So if I parked my car and paid 25 cents because I thought I'd only be there for 15 minutes, if I'm wrong, just wave your hand, I'll stop talking. Am I wrong? I just, just want to respond to that point on Park okay. NYC. So it, the app should be allowing you to, to, to renew your time up to the time limit if it's not. If after it's after it expires. In other words, if I bought 15 minutes and if, now if it's it 18 yeah. minutes and I want to renew at the same meter, I can just renew it? So you have to renew it before it expires and you, you should be That's able to I set it said. up to get an alert to, to no, no, no. renew it I, before sir, the expiration. I agree with what you're saying. I can do it before it expires. But I'm saying, I parked for 15 minutes, put the quarter on the app, went into the dry cleaners, but lo and behold, there's 11 people in front of me, so it took me 17 minutes. And I didn't take out my phone and put more time in. But now I realize it's 17 minutes later. Gosh, I gotta put another quarter on the app. And I take out my phone and I try to do that. No, sir. No, you can't do that. You're, you're correct. That's and, right. And I think that's, that's a, something that's we broken. would love to work with you on. And, Don't work and with me on it. I'm not a tech guy. It's broken. It didn't break yesterday. It's been broken since the day you rolled it out. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not here to, to micromanage your agency. Anybody who follows me on Twitter knows I can't manage anything in your agency. But there, there are things that you're doing that are so simple to, to, to not do. And you just don't want to do it. And then you come in front of the council, and I'm sorry that the commissioner couldn't be bothered. I'm sure she's very busy today p painting bus lanes in my neighborhood. But the idea that, that you're here today and you can't find a single idea that we like, Mr. Chairman, I recognize the clock and I'll wrap up. You can't find a single idea that you, that we, you like. You can't find, you know these problems exist and the app has rolled out for two years and I've been using it for the entirety of the two years. I'm sure that's something that you can check and see my name in there and how much money I put in it. I still use it all the time. You know these problems exist. Don't tell us that, hey, you know, we, we know, it's not a final product yet. No, no uh, technology product is ever a final product, but these are problems you know of. Um, replace the signs, it's not something, it's not rocket science. You know that a sign, you New Yorkers have to let us know when the sign is bad. No, your traffic agents have to let you know when the sign is bad. We pay them. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your time, thank you. Council Member Kuhn. Sorry, Councilman Constantini, that's fine. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Um, so, just quickly about the LPIs. What is the process that DOT looks at for the installation of LPIs? Council member, thank you very much um, for the question and for hey, your that's, interest that's, that's in LPIs. <laughs> really, um, we, we agree with you strongly that it's a great tool. And so what we do mm -hmm. um, to roll them out is we're actually looking at places where pedestrians were, um, were injured over time. So we have crash data that we're, we're sorting through and looking for uh, corridors and intersections that show a history of those type of crashes. And that's where we focus the, the effort for LPIs. So um, it's, you know, it's, I think it's in the same vein as what you're proposing, but it's just a slightly different way of looking at it. All right, so how many do we install every year? Uh, last year it was 855. 855? Yep. Okay, and how many of them were near schools? We could do an analysis and get you that number, but, but again, we're not, we're not tying them to schools, we're tying them to where the pedestrians were being injured. So I don't know, the, I don't have that number, but there would be many that are near schools, for sure. 
hundreds. And, and, and I, I wholeheartedly agree that we have to take care of those intersections. There's not a disagreement there. I'm just saying that to be as a proactive step, right? I mean, I would rather have a situation where we're not responding to a tragedy and actually get out in front. And these are areas where senior centers, parks, schools, hospitals, where we have uh, you know, children, seniors crossing the street where there's potential for issues and we're trying to be proactive. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that we can take care of the reactive issues, which are very serious, and still be proactive, correct? We, we would love to do both, and we do try to do both. And, and so I think we, we take any and all requests that people have for LPIs, and we, and we accommodate those, as well as the approach I was describing. So I'm not trying, I agree very much so with you that LPIs are a great tool. We mm -hmm. are trying to prote protect pedestrians in the best way we can, and there's an efficiency to to, to doing groupings of them, and that's what we do, but we absolutely take requests and want to be proactive with you as well. And, and I think that we need to do more than just take requests. I think we need to be a little bit more proactive here in our, in our policy. Um, me being able to point out particular intersections, I may or may not get an LPI, they're a great tool, we should, we should come up with a more formulated idea than just me sending you requests, correct? Well, we, we would love to sit down with you and explore revisions to our, our methodology and see what, whether we could come up with uh, something that, you know, is a little different, different than what we've been using, but continuing to, uh, you know, address the need. All right, and so moving on to uh, the nighttime deliveries. Uh, you know, we all, I mean, I think that, again, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with the administration's Vision Zero plan and I think this fits within it. What would need to happen for us to get uh, an agreement with DCAS here to, to make this a reality? So we've, uh, we've spoken with DCAS and I think, um, you know, DOT ourselves, we've undertaken an assessment of our own deliveries as, to try to get um, familiar and, and come up with our own internal strategy around uh, evening deliveries. But I think, you know, they're eager to to look at this issue um, with us, with you. So I think we could, uh, we could explore this further together and I think um, it's something there's a lot of interest around. Yeah, I, I think that we need to get it done, right? As we're looking to reduce traffic on our streets, coming up and having the city lead the way when it comes to nighttime deliveries and getting those deliveries in during non-rush hour times when our streets are already packed, already dealing with lots of congestion, getting city deliveries off the road during those times are extremely important. I think we have that shared goal, correct? Yes, I agree with you. And I think it's, it's a paradox where, you know, a lot of it's hard for people to see what those benefits are. It's sort of abstract. So I think, uh, you know, demonstrating it is, is the way to go. Uh, so do I. I think it's time for us to lead the way. So I appreciate that we're going to be able to get there on this. And I look forward to working with the chair to getting uh, this plan done. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just, I'll just comment on this whole issue of the um, the DSNY opposition to these two bills today, and I'll, I'll just say how silly it sounds. Frankly, I wasn't going to comment, but just hearing the defense that somehow losing two days of, of broom is going to somehow you know, point our city in a bad direction when it comes to street cleaning, I, I, I find it to be a very flimsy argument. I, I really do. I think there are 365 days in the year. There are 34 days that are currently uh, that are suspended, adding two more uh, in the respect of particular holidays for our Latino communities, for our, for our Asian communities, just makes sense. And so the argument that we're making today, it, it, I, I hear it and it, does, it just doesn't ring true in any way, shape, or form. So that's my comment. You can respond to that or not. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Dutch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for this important hearing. So firstly, I, I just want to commend um, Deputy Commissioner Rebecca Zack. That's the title I gave you. Um, and I could definitely say that you could walk, chew gum, talk on the phone, and listen, everything at the same time. So I commend you for being able to multitask. And we, I had a great experience always with you offline and online. Um, so I want to thank you for everything you do. Um, so I just want to um, I touch upon um, intro 570. So um, in testimony, you mentioned that when a uh, sign is faded, it's as simple as looking up and down the block for the next sign to confirm whether parking is legal. 
So our city, just I want to mention that it needs to be accommodating for all. And it's very difficult for a senior citizen when uh, he or she needs to walk out of the car to start looking for unfaded sign uh, that's legible, as well as parents with children, um, you know, to walk out of the car. Otherwise, you would have to leave the kids behind in the car, which is not good. But then you have to walk out with the children to go look for a uh, sign that is legible. So I just want to make a recommendation that if we could do, um, you did mention that the public is not doing a good job reporting signs and that need to be replaced. If we could do some type of outreach, because I know sometimes it takes a while for a faded sign to be replaced. Do you know what the, time, the timeline is between a report uh, of a faded sign to when, this, when DOT corrects that? So, council member, it's an excellent question. Um, Safety-related signs uh, get the highest priority, so a stop sign, do not enter one way, um, and uh, parking signs are, are, are in the next tier, so it's not immediate, but um, I really like the idea of outreach to encourage reporting, um, if that's what you're getting at, to, to really you know, get, get the information in so we can get out there and fix these signs right away. That would be a, a great way to handle the, the concern. Okay, so if we could do outreach, and I would definitely want to be involved in that and to let my constituents know that if we have a certain week that we could call it in and this way we, we, we compile a list of all the faded signs uh, throughout the district. But also when it comes to a summons, I know that DOT is not the one to decide if someone is found innocent or guilty. So um, we just need to send out a message just that if a senior, someone has a defense, this is something that is pretty common sense that if a person cannot get a legible sign, shouldn't, shouldn't always be found guilty, shouldn't be found guilty at all on that summons. One other thing I wanted to mention is the truck loading and unloading um, that was just installed recently in my district in certain areas that I've been working with MTA and DOT about. So I did bring it up to, the, um, to DOT that those signs, the new signs, number one, they are the same color as the other signs. So it's very difficult for people to really realize that a new sign came up and it defeats the whole purpose because people are parking in the truck loading and unloading zones without re realizing that it's a, it's a new sign. So two things, one, my request was if they could put it, uh, they could place, put in another color like the no standing anytime signage and if they could do that like as soon as possible because people are receiving summonses every single day now. Uh, they're coming to my office, so it's, uh, those are unjust summonses because you, it's very confusing. So if they could put a red sign, like the no standing signs, number one, and number two is that I put in an intro that all new signage from DOT should have the words new on top because I know on some signs you do have it and others you don't, so people don't know that it's a new sign when you um, install a parking, loading, and unloading sign. But the left turns, you do have the words new on top. So I have an intro on that. I hope you're going to support it to have the words new on every single sign that's installed by DOT. Uh, those are basically the two issues that I have for today. And uh, we'll definitely, we definitely have, um, yeah, you want to say something? Thanks, Council Member. No, I was, I was going to ask if you could have Tova follow up directly with me regarding the loading and no, the new unloading in your district. I'm assuming she's back from her honeymoon? Yeah, she's back Great. from her honeymoon and you she's probably watching. Directly with me, you probably have the email already in the inbox. I probably do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Just, Thank you very much. One more comment on, yes. on the signs. Very much appreciate your interest in the maintenance of the signs and, and um, and it, DOT takes this very seriously. Um, I, it, the, num the numbers I gave in my testimony represent about 10% of all signs being replaced every year. So we're really, we take it seriously. We would love more customer feedback on where we need to focus. Um, we, want, we want the signs to be clear for everyone. We don't want anyone to be getting a, a summons because they didn't understand what the sign was trying to convey. Thank you, thank you for your partnership, thank you. Councilman Miller. Good morning, thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez. And I want to thank my colleagues for the introduction of these important uh, LSs and legislation that we're speaking about this morning um, in, in a number of different ways that reflect the, the communities uh, throughout the city, the, the, the needs and the values of communities. And so before I talk about 
uh, my intros, I, I'd certainly like to, uh, to elaborate on those, uh, particularly uh, Three Kings and uh, Lunar New Year certainly reflect the values and the needs of a, a significant portion of our uh, community and our citizenry, citizenry around the city of New York and, and certainly their quality of life and, and, and their uh, religious, faith-based and cultural uh, commitments uh, are being impeded when we don't recognize their needs um, as we have uh, for communities in the past. So I wanna go on the record uh, by saying that, and, and let me further say that in the five years that I've been part of this transportation committee, today was not the first time, nor the second or third time that we questioned the diversity of the DOT and its impact on the communities that they serve and its policy and decision making. So um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to uh, further have that conversation with the um, Commissioner, and, and certainly we have had that conversation in the past. As we talk about the uh, LPIs, uh, I know that my office has uh, requested annually slow zones around parks, hospitals, churches, synagogues, mosques, and schools, and um, that has yet to come to fruition either. So we'd like to, work, to continue work collaboratively, but we'd like to work expeditiously when we know that um, these, uh, spe th these slow zones are absolutely necessary in keeping uh, our communities and our most vulnerable safe. Uh, also, and uh, while I think the entire package is, is, is relevant to um, the quality of life of our city, uh, one more, the, the, the sidewalk um, introductions is certainly something that we have been talking about for a number of years now. The congestion in our commercial uh, corridors, there are, there are store owners who have more product on the street than they have in their stores, and that is unacceptable, but we have not gotten the support from the administration that we need. We've done a number of uh, walkthroughs with sanitation, uh, which temporarily helped. We had DCA and, and even DOT along, but without constant um, enforcement, it is not working. So again, um, we are, I am here specifically to talk about intros 1010 and 1011, and I, and, and I have my uh, esteemed assembly member, Mr. Clyde Bennell, who shares the district with me. We have our community board chair, uh, Ms. Renee Hill, and our transportation uh, uh, chair from community board 12, as well, Ms. Michelle Keller, to, to highlight how critical this uh, issue is in our community. These bills would reduce the amount of time during which 18 wheelers can be legally parked from three hours to 90 minutes and increase the fine for violation to $400 and subsequent violation within six month period to $800. The, park, the parking abuse of 18 wheel commercial big rigs have been persistent quality of life issue throughout our city from St. Albans to Bay Ridge. They reduce road traffic, the most uh, monstrous park next to our playgrounds, schools, homes, for hours, sometimes even days at a time. They block fire hydrants, they idle to keep warm, cool in the summer and keep warm during the winter, all while being parked in these, our residential communities. As you can see by the photos that are displayed here, our neighborhoods are routinely used as privately Par private parking lots for these vehicles, which is simply unacceptable. The, com the Commercial Truck Abuse Act will make the course of doing business more than just the, the, the companies uh, can afford to bear, which they have always been more than willing to do in the past at the expense of our quality of life. And I want those who would argue that the legislation is burdensome on small business to take a close look at these photos and ask themselves would they tolerate this abuse in their communities? And I dare say not. These proposals are not about doing harm to commercial trucking. They are about discouraging the most flagrant parking abuses by industry's worst actors. I want to also acknowledge the co-sponsor of this legislation for their great support, Councilmember Adams, uh, Richards, Kazowitz, and Casa Tanides. I look forward to this, the hearing and, and once again hearing from DOT and the stakeholders 
in the effort to address the, re the regrettable lack of parking facilities uh, throughout the city for these commercial vehicles. Um, but let me just say that we have sat down with the commercial trucking industry. We've had this conversation with our colleagues, DOT, um, NYPD, and, and, and others uh, in an effort to resolve this issue. And sometimes um, it, is our, it is our goal that we can educate so that we can bring about um, the resolve and, and create the quality of life that our, 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 our communities so richly deserve. But when you can't educate, you, you, you must legislate. These pictures here are absolutely indicative of the abuse that communities throughout the city see. It is not limited to Southeast Queens. And when I met with the uh, commercial trucking industry, they submit that the, uh, the, the big guys, the, the, uh, uh, the um, FedExes and the UPSs and the others of the world uh, were not subject to that, that they had access to parking facilities. Well, I would submit to you that is just not the case. As we see, we see Target over here. I have here, uh, there is a, a single um, FedEx, 18-wheel FedEx truck that for four weekends in a row have been parked on a, on a residential street. And we're talking about from Friday night to Monday morning. And this abuse absolutely has to stop. So um, I, I'm hoping that uh, my, we, I think we have about 32 sponsors, which indicate that this is not limited to Southeast Queens, the borough of Queens, but this is happening throughout the city of New York. Um, and that it has a tremendous impact, not just on the quality of life, but the health and safety of our residents. And we ask that our uh, colleagues support this. And I look forward to not just the passage of this legislation, but certainly enforcement. The problem is that we, 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 we study and we have reporting bills and we, we, we create laws and, and we just don't have the ability to enforce this and our communities continue to be abused. So I, I look forward to working with the chair on this and other issues. But uh, as, and, and let me just reiterate as the chair of the Black Latino Asian Caucus that I want to, that represents four and a half million New Yorkers here in this city, that there are communities that are not being heard, their voices and their values are not being heard and we simply, by addressing these simple parking alternate side uh, regulations would go a long way in saying that we value the voices of those communities as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Miller, I, before Councilmember Dodge leave to another responsibility that I have, so I would like for him to join me and everyone here standing up in solidarity to the Jewish community for the hate attack that happened two days ago. As we have said before, a attack against the Jews, the Muslim, the Latinos, the Asian, the white, the African American, is a attack on all of us. So please join me standing up in solidarity and prayer to the family of those who lost their loved one two days ago in the hate attack. Thank you. No matter where the attack happened, we as a city and the nation will continue fighting to be sure that at some points a generation will be able to eradicate hate for our society. Councilmember Menchaco. Thank you, Chair, and uh, we all join in solidarity for that message of healing uh, and solidarity. Thank you. I, I wanna spend some time, I wanna spend my time thinking about our, uh, or one of my favorite things, the leading pedestrian intervals. Uh, so I'm gonna start with some, some kind of basic questions and then maybe end with an update on our project that we're working on together. Uh, that has more to deal with um, the bike relationship with the LPIs. And so I'll let your team kind of get an update for me on that, for us on that. But let's talk a little bit about LPIs in general. 
and the testimony really spoke to a vision about the LPIs that was connected to Vision Zero, but I want to get a sense from you all about what, what is your goal? Uh, you reference double, uh, in, that you're hitting more than double your goal every year. What is that goal? Uh, what's the ultimate long game on LPIs? Uh, and we'll start there. Thank you, council member. So um, as I mentioned before, we, at DOT, we believe that L leading pedestrian intervals, a head start for pedestrian at an intersection is a very powerful safety tool. Um, it's, a, it's a part of Vision Zero, um, and that's why we've uh, aggressively pursued this. We used to do, you know, uh, 10 to 15, 20 per year. Uh, so what is, what is that goal today? So there's, there's a 400 target in the Vision Zero action plan, um, but... But you're clearly not yeah, we, meeting no. that goal. You're doubling, you're right, tripling that right. goal. And, so then and that's what, what's, the real, what's the real goal around LPIs? I mean, we're doing as many as, as the team can support, really. And I have, I'm very lucky I have a great team who has been uh, attacking this with a lot of gusto. And I really- And I've met some of those folks and they're incredible, incredible analysts and team members. So I, I guess I wanna get to a sense of, you, know, you, you, have a, you have a goal that you're almost ignoring because you're aggressively implementing them across the city because you believe in them. And we're trying to create a, a sense of of relationship to 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 areas that in our district are uh, vulnerable spaces. So I really want to get a sense from you and your team about what 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 is that goal, that long-term goal, and and the aggressive nature of these of the, the installation of the LPIs really tell me that a couple of things. One, there's a limit. So there's only a certain amount of intersections that have opportunities for this. So that's We'll, we'll, we'll hit, if we, if we don't stop, we'll, we'll hit at every intersection. And so is that the goal, to hit every intersection of the city? I wanna get a sense, not just the, the kind of advocacy. Help me understand. Right, so very, very good questions and I appreciate your, your, uh, your um, interest in the details of how we do it. So um, the, the guiding um, light for us really is um, the Vision Zero priority corridors, priority intersections. So going back and looking at um, crash history over time, where are pedestrians uh, vulnerable by the, the fact that we know that people have actually been injured at those intersections and, and then focusing on those areas. So some of the biggest, um, the biggest streets that you, know, you might think of as being the, the high risk streets in your community are the ones that we are focusing on. So like, let's say, you know, uh, Queens Boulevard, a Northern Boulevard, uh, a Fourth Avenue in Brooklyn, uh, you know, those types of like major thoroughfares are the ones that are getting the focus. Um, and they certainly include many schools, senior centers, et cetera. It's not that, you know, I don't, hope I didn't give the impression to your colleague that we don't think this LPI treatment applies to those facilities, it absolutely does. Um, however, w what we're saying is, because of the urgent need uh, to protect life and limb, we wanna focus on those facilities that happen to be on the streets that we know have a history of, of crashes first, and then move on to the streets that, that have less of a, of a history. Um, will we get to every intersection? I would like to. There are gonna be some where it's just not really relevant because there's something else going on where, let's say there's, a, there's an all pedestrian phase or there's turning phases where the the crosswalks are protected in some other fashion, so there are some few intersections where it's just not really relevant to the way that intersection is managed, but for the most part, um, we're finding that it, it fits nicely on your, your typical intersection. Great, and so, so I think I got a better sense and we, we wanna continue that conversation, and if you can end, please, with just an update on that uh, great pilot that we have started that is getting us uh, uh, some good details and information about utilizing the LPIs, not just for our pedestrians, but for bike ride, uh, bicyclists to get use that same head start uh, for, for these intersections. And there's 50 intersections that are uh, being studied right now. Give Correct. us a sense about uh, 
what's going on, next steps. Correct, so I know that the pilot runs through the end of this month, which is obviously this week, and then there will be a period of time in which we review all the data that we that the uh, traffic and planning team put together, and uh, I don't have like those numbers at my fingertips right now, um, but I think uh, everything indicates that things went well, but uh, I haven't gotten kind of an overall summary of how the whole entire six months went. Um, I don't have a timeline for when that would be done, but I'm assuming they've been gathering data this whole time, and just to be uh, tying a ribbon on that soon. Let's set up a follow-up meeting and, Absolutely. and, and get crunching Absolutely. together. Thank you. I appreciate that. Member, I would like to uh, go back to a few of the questions. Uh, can you please read those uh, are ten, the suspend alternative side parking day that we have so far? Chairman, you'd like me to reread the list? Please. Sure. New Year's Day, Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, Lincoln's birthday, Ash Wednesday, Asian Lunar New Year, Washington's birthday, Purim, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Passover, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Passover, Solemnity of Ascension, Shavuot, Eid al Fitr, uh, Memorial Day, Independence Day, the Feast of Assumption, Idul Aha, Labor Day, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkoth, Shemni Alstareth, Simkas Torah, Columbus Day, All Saints Day, Diwali, Election Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving Day, the Immaculate Conception, and Christmas Day. Is that true that the day after Christmas is one of those days that uh, people get more tickets? The day after, I have no idea. Okay, I think that, let's see how we can look at those numbers because what I heard, especially someone that is Catholic and follow the Christmas tradition, I heard in my communities that the day after Christmas is like a day for us, that's when the day when we definitely spend most of the time celebrating with our families. But I don't want to, you know, add, add, add a new bill. All I want to see if you can also look at those number because what I heard is a lot of people get confused because the day after Christmas, like for the Catholic, especially I'm, I can talk about the Latino piece, that's the day after where people is thin, that they, that they still can, that they are parking are suspended. But if you can look at the number, it would be very good. Okay. I, 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 I is gonna say that no doubt that all those days that you, you mentioned are important day for our city. And I'm happy that we honor those days in different ways. One of them is uh, suspending alternative side parking regulation. But I hope that you guys, as you go back and report to your boss and to the mayor's office, who you know will be communicated with this in DOT, it, the message here is loud and clear. We are the council. We, you heard from different council members not only the Asian and the Latino, but all the brothers and sisters who say, we should also suspend alternative side parking regulation on the Lunar New Year's and on the Three King Day. So again, I hope that we will continue working, conversation with you guys, DOT and sanitation, and see how we can make progress because those two days are very important for both community. The Latino who make the 29% of the city and the Asian community who make, I believe it's around 17% of the city. Uh, so, so I want to touch base on, on the pedestrians come down signal. Uh, as you know, we've been working and I can say that we've been making a lot of improvements on installing a number of them in our street, but Question was always why are we asking for more and why now? And the question, the answer is because we want to make our streets safe for all. And, and as much work we do to increase the number of the countdown signals, it safer, the more safer our pedestrian will be. So the question is how many intersections in the city have pedestrian countdown signals? And how many are in each borough? Can you give us a sec? 
So we do have the, the numbers, council member, and thank you um, for your interest in pedestrian countdown signals. We definitely um, agree, I think, with, with uh, the spirit of this, this bill that it, it is a safety feature for, for pedestrians. It does help. We've studied um, the effect pedestrian countdown signals have, um, and, we'll, and we found uh, both, and particularly with, with older pedestrians and, and young children, um, that we, we see them uh, actually waiting uh, to step off when they see that the countdown is low, whereas in the past they would have just had the flashing hand signal. Um, so there, there are about uh, 7,500 intersections that currently have pedestrian countdown signals, and by borough it's about 2,000 each in Manhattan and Queens, about 1,000 in the Bronx, uh, 2,200 in Brooklyn, and 324 in Staten Island. So um, it's, you know, again, something we want to continue to expand this program. Um, streets that are uh, wide, uh, on the wider side are the ones where it tends to deliver the best benefit, and so we're, we look forward to working with you to keep expanding. Yeah, that's uh, more than half of, of intersections have this already right. currently. And what is, what are our projections on how many should we have, should, do we need? And of course, it's not as many as possible but on real number. What is the projection that we have based on how many do we need and how many are we looking to install every year in the next few years? Right, so we're, we're continually, um, expanding this program as we go. Um, I don't, we don't have the final number calculated just yet. We um, are also, we're adjusting the criteria slightly to account for slower moving pedestrians. Um, the, the, the width of the street that we use to, to be the, the threshold was based on, and uh, originally based on a, a, a faster walking speed and more recently we've switched to a slower walking speed to account for older uh, pedestrians or, or pedestrians with mobility impairments. We think it's important to uh, provide the greatest benefit to uh, those folks who are, are having trouble moving um, quickly because they're the ones who actually benefit the most from seeing how much time they have remaining. So, um, I, but I, I, would, I would imagine we'll be uh, close to, uh, you know, two thirds to three quarters of the intersections would have these when, when we get uh, complete. And specific to the bill that Councilmember Matteo introduced, and I know that I believe Councilmember Yeager is on, of the hundred and the red light cameras where those are now, almost a um, hundred of them have uh, pedestrian countdowns at them now, and we are in the process of reviewing the ones that don't to see which ones meet um, our, our guidelines, our engineering guidelines to install them there. So I, I did wanna highlight that um, we're not opposing that bill, we're, we wanna work with you guys on that. How much does it cost uh, to replace a regular signal uh, with a pedestrian countdown signal? Without we don't have the cost figures with us, uh, Council Member. Um, the, what, you're, what we replace is just the um, display, the pedestrian um, walk, don't walk display. So it's not uh, the, you know, the, the controller that controls the signal is already capable of powering the countdown and um, it's, you know, it's, it's not one of the most expensive um, uh, treatments that we're able to do. It's, 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 a lo it's a lower cost item because it's really just unplugging the display and plugging a new one in. So it's, it's a pretty good value proposition. And what is the OT process to, for adding a pedestrian come down a signal or uh, to our intersection, and why are some in, uh, intersections choosing uh, over other? Does DOT currently pair pedestrian countdown signal with red light cameras? So it's it's a width-based criteria and uh, uh, how wide the crossing is for pedestrians. Um, and if it's 40 feet, the street is 40 feet or wider with no parking, or 48 feet or wider with with parking. Um, that's that's the threshold. Um, we've been working in large um, groups of intersections that are nearby and, and contracting out the work to, for efficiency purposes. So that's why you see kind of, you know, one corridor at a time receives the, the countdowns and then we move on to the next. And so 
Um, you know, we're constantly looking for additional locations and um, it's something that a lot of the, the locations we've gotten to already have been community driven and, and we, it's a program we're happy to uh, work that way, but we also have our own inspectors who go out and assess and look for locations. Do, do you have the number, the data on what percentage of crashes happen in intersection? I'm sorry, can I just clarify the question? You mean as uh, all crashes? Crashes, what yeah. Percentage what percent happen is happening in intersections? I don't think I have the number at my fingertips, but it's it's a very high percentage. I'm thinking of a Vision Zero uh, oh. ad that was in bus stops last year, and I want to say it said 75%, but um, that's the, the number that jumped out at me. It was high, but I don't quote, I mean, I know I'm testifying. To I, 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 yes, I mean, feel. I'm just saying, like, that's the number, I'm thinking of the ad in my head, and that's I remember it being quite that high. I just feel that looking at, you know, expediting the process to bring additional calm downs, you know, a, a initiative in the intersection is so critical. And I'm not thinking about as a council member, I'm thinking about as a father of two daughters, a five and 11, and a mother who is 87. And I, you know, I can tell you that most of the bill that I have introduced has not been the result of doing a lot of research from the beginning. That has come from just walking in the street and see what do we need. And when I walk, it doesn't matter the intersection. It can be York Avenue, not his first, third, first, or it can be Arden and Broadway. I think that still we have to continue, and I'm committed to continue to being a partner in that initiative with you guys to bring more tools to the intersection to calm down the way of how drivers turn. Mm -hmm. Because again, without having the data, you have the engineer, but based on conversation that we have, we know that still today, based on those information, a lot of crashes happen in intersections. We have made a lot of progress. Like in the last, I give a lot of credits in the last eight years, we have continued what the previous administration started doing too. So it's not something new. But we, we I, anyone can see how we've been able to, to improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists. But, you know, I think that it is important, and I know that you guys have your information back in the agency to know what is the projection, how many are needed today, how many more are we, are we expecting to do this year. So as we are getting ready for our 2019 budget, so that we start discussing about how, and I'm committed to advocate to bring span, increase the investments for those need that we have to improve safety for this. We always appreciate your support. We've had a wonderful partnership the past five years, and together we've driven down pedestrian debts at a record pace. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Zach, I, I do appreciate that, uh, and I read your testimony, I saw that the, you mentioned that the two thirds were done, and I do appreciate that. My point, of course, was just love it if you came in here and said that's a great idea and we're doing it anyway, and yes, enact the bill because we're gonna get there and there's only a third to go. Um, uh, I wanted to, uh, thank you. I, just uh, with sanitation, I think you said that there were, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you said 34, 34 holidays on which alternate side of the street parking is currently suspended. 34. Apologies, 34 uh, causes. I think it's 41 days in 2018 on the calendar because some of them are multiple, like Passover first and second day, Passover seventh and eighth day, that kind right. of thing. The section 19-163 uh, of the administrative code uh, provides, by my count, 28 days, which are religious or, or cultural days, and then there are additional days which are legal holidays in which your guys are not working, frankly, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and so you said there were 41? I, I believe it's 41 okay. for 2018. And then when, w uh, there are times when some of the holidays that are in section 19-163 of the administrative code actually fall out on legal holidays on which all to the side of the street parking is suspended. For example, Passover and might fall out for on uh, Good Friday. And then you know, they're together, or uh, Sukkot may fall out on Columbus Day. Um, so alternate is being suspended as well on those days. In addition, 
uh, to, is alternate side of streets parking suspended on Saturdays in the city? Uh, there's very limited parking. There are some. It's very limited. Okay. So uh, with alternate being suspended across the board on Sundays and almost all across the board on Saturdays, that there's a statistical likelihood that any single day that we add to the suspension calendar results in a 30% chance that it falls out on a weekend over the course of a year, on any given year, right? There's two That's out of seven. That's the math, yeah. Two out of seven. So what we're talking about, and that's why I'd like you to go back to the department and really give this great consideration. I, I signed on to both of these bills because, frankly, my community does have an enormous um, number of holidays. We have them uh, by the calendar for the very specific reason that we can't, as the Orthodox community, we can't move our cars, we can't drive, we don't drive. So if we have a two-day holiday back-to-back, -back, we need to park our cars and alternate as every other day in some places, we need to have a place to put our cars. Um, so we monopolize the calendar, and I recognize that in many respects, but I also recognize that we're, it's an incredible city. I'm looking at the names of these holidays and the, the, the Christian community, the, the uh, Orthodox Christian community, the Roman Catholic community, the Muslim community, Diwali is in there. Of course, the Jewish holidays, you have Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Ascension Thursday, all of these holidays representing the cultures of our city. And now two new not new, but two groups are coming before their legislature and saying, we're part of our city too. Lunar New Year, um, Three Kings Day, they deserve it, they earned it. They're part of our city. And so I would like you very much to take that back to the administration and, and, and come back to the council and say, you know, we can, we can afford these two more days. The city is not gonna fall apart for two more days. And uh, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So with that, I hope that you, you know we will continue conversation. And I know I know guy, you know, you have to do your job and, and we have to continue working in, with you as an agency but also with the administration. It, again, Latinos and Asian, we are not begging. We are saying we are here. And I think it is important not only for the Latino and Asian, it's very important for everyone because we are a city made with the diversity of all the good that we have come here and make our city our home. So with that, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Now let's go our panel. Uh, Kelly Hesh from on behalf of the Ali Taylor, Sandy McCallum, Bexy Sagison, and Chelsea Brown Rich? Brown Rich. I would also like to acknowledge Council Member Richard was here. Then we have Saj Miller. It, okay, let's Saj, let's wait for the next panel. Okay, thanks. You may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation. My name is Chelsea Brownridge. I'm the founder of Dogspot, a company that manufactures pet harbors here in New York City. Out of respect for time, I submitted my entire testimony for public record, but I'll just speak simply to the most essential points here today. I'm here to call on the council to pass introduction 886. My company, Dogspot, was born in a garage in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn in 2014 as a solution for people who need a place for their pet while they go to the store. A very simple concept. But the reality is, is that there's a law out there now where stores can't allow dogs inside. About 60% of our stores are legally prohibited from allowing pets inside. And there's no solution out there. And our pets are now being tied up and left outside. And businesses are losing business as a result because they're turning away customers that have pets. For more than two years, Dogspot operated a network of these safe, internet-connected, climate-controlled dog houses on Brooklyn sidewalks without incident. From the beginning, we developed a partnership with the city. We were awarded grant money from the New York City Economic Development Corporation and the Brooklyn Public Library. 
We were given an invitation from City Hall to represent our technology on the world stage at the Smart City Expo in Barcelona. Then, unexpectedly, the Department of Transportation ordered that our dog houses need to be removed. Receiving this cease and desist order from the Department of Transportation was a shocking and enormously disappointing event for our small company. We were being forced to choose between removing our houses from the members that we were serving and the businesses, or fighting in court if for the city that we love and wanted to continue to grow our business in. So we opted to remove our houses from public sidewalks, not for a lack of belief in our service and the benefit that it brings to the city, but in favor of collaboration with the city. So in short order, we were forced to stop serving our customers. Luckily, we were fortunate enough to be quickly met with enthusiastic invitations from many other municipalities, including Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Orlando, Kansas City, Columbus, and dozens of others. I agree wholeheartedly with the presumed bias of the DOT's concern that pedestrians need to move freely. But it's a lazy argument that our houses are an impediment to sidewalk. They're less than three feet deep, and are, they add order to the sidewalks, because now dogs are being tied up on sidewalks, and that's an impediment to people being able to move freely. This legislation will provide dogs and their guardians a safe and humane alternative to leaving dogs unattended, and provides opportunities to support retail business owners that currently can't allow dogs inside. The bill will send a message to other entrepreneurs that will echo for years to come. When you take time to work with government, government can work with you as well. I strongly urge the council to support Introduction 886, it supports New Yorkers and small businesses. I'd like to thank Councilmember Espinal for his leadership and Chair Rodriguez and the entire committee again for allowing me to speak and I'm happy to answer any questions. During the time that they had Dog Spot in Brooklyn, I was able to shop in the neighborhood, in the greater neighborhood. At, at age 80, I can't just go running around the neighborhood as much as I, as I used to. So I would take my dog and put her in the little dog house and sh do my shopping in the neighborhood. Or decide, I, I haven't been shopping on, I don't think I've been shopping back on Vanderbilt Avenue since the dog spot has been removed. So it, instead of shopping in the neighborhood, I'm using Fresh Direct or Amazon, and it was much better to be able to, to use the neighborhood stores and restaurants, especially the restaurants. If you don't plan to go in and have breakfast, and then, on, but you're there with the dog, and you can go across the street and put the dog safely somewhere while you do that. It works out very nicely. So I've very much missed having Dog Spot there. Thank you. Would you like to say your name, Ms. Paul Reckon? My name is Betsy Sargison, and I live in Brooklyn. Thank you. I'm Sandy McCallion. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez and the Council. Um, I concur with what Chelsea said, and I was actually somewhat surprised to hear the DOT object to this, to these dog spot houses on safety grounds. As I walked to the subway, my 10 minute walk to the subway this morning, I passed five or six dogs that were tied up outside of businesses. It's not safe for the dogs. We have had incidents where dogs have been stolen in Brooklyn, but also as pedestrians walk, there are some people who are frightened of dogs and the children are, are running to the dogs or running away from the dogs and that's not a safe situation. These dog spot houses were incredible. They don't infringe on the sidewalk at all. They're set back next to businesses. If you decide to go out and suddenly realize that you need to run an errand and you have your dog with you, you can put it in there. It's actually kind of fun to watch your dog inside because you can see it in the app. It's a wonderful, wonderful service. I was very fortunate to have it in Brooklyn. I was fortunate to be in a neighborhood that it was there. I asked for more to be put there and suddenly they were gone. Please bring them back. Good afternoon, my name is Kelly Hodges and my dog Franklin was actually the first member of Dog Spot. But I'm gonna be talking today and reading the statement of Allie Taylor who couldn't be here with you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez. Thank you to all of the committee members for holding today's hearing on Intro 886. My name is Allie Taylor and I'm the president and founder of Voters for Animal Rights. I'm speaking today in my capacity as a professional dog walker and volunteer animal rescuer in Bed-Stuy in Bushwick, Brooklyn. I urge the committee to support Intro 886, which would allow pet harbors to be placed on public sidewalks of commercial establishments in New York City. 
Having met with the founders of Dogspot and thoroughly evaluated the pet harbor, I believe that they have done an excellent job of addressing the safety and behavioral needs of urban pets and their caretakers. I also spoke at length with my dog walking clients who are also in support of the pet harbors. Pet harbors are a win-win for New York City's dogs. Pet guardians, animal rescuers, and local businesses. The availability of safe, convenient, afford affordable care for dogs makes it easier for New Yorkers considering adoption to make the decision to welcome a pet into their family and keep them permanently. Decreasing barriers to adoption is one of the best ways to help more homeless pets find their forever homes. Additionally, every year, numerous dogs are stolen by well-intentioned pet parents who stop into a store just a minute. Pet harbors would provide a secure alternative to tying up a dog and leaving them unattended. Over the years, our city has evolved to become more accommodating to growing families with children, and now, as dogs become a part of an increasing number of New York City's families too, we are seeing our city policies change with more dog-friendly restaurants, bars, and transportation options. I believe that pet harbors would positively broaden our city's pet services and urge the passing of Intro 886. Thank you for your time. I truly believe that animal rights is an extension of human rights. And, and again, most of my approach understanding has happening from my role working and interacting with so many groups that they advocate for animal rights. And now again that I have my five years old who love animals and take me to many places like I've been going to the safe a haven sanctuary animal that a great professor, Professor Crane from City College, who was the dean of the School of Engineering, his wife, who is a doctor, created. A, and be able to see, you know, in our experience working here with so many a New Yorkers, a, I have come to the conclusion you know, that not only because I was born and raised in a farm, back in the Caribbean, the Dominican Republic, but here in New York City. 100,000 or millions of people have their animals as part of their life. And they are important for our children, our young generation, for senior citizens. So it, for me, whatever I can do to be helpful on this bill, I will do my part. Uh, what do you think, what difference will we make if we pass this bill at the council? There's a few stakeholders that would benefit greatly from this. So the obvious one is, of course, our dogs, our family, and the people that have dogs in their family, being able to more conveniently walk and move about the city with their dogs and in a safe way. Right now, what you'll see up and down almost any given commercial street is dogs tied up. Uh, and again, as I mentioned in my testimony, that's not safe for sidewalks either. And so uh, what we're trying to do is create a safe uh, environment for those dogs um, so that pedestrians can move freely, so that dogs can be safe. Um, and so that's important on that front. Um, the second uh, benefit uh, to the city would be to the small businesses themselves. One of the things we learned in our time operating here is that our members, like Betsy just mentioned, were shopping more often in stores. It's really difficult for small businesses um, to stay in business in the city these days and um, to give them another reason that they have to turn away customers because people want to bring their dogs with them and they can't um, is really difficult for small business owners. So early on when we were talking to them, uh, the store owners themselves, they were extremely excited and you'll have fine testimony in the packets that we shared from those business owners. Uh, unfortunately, they're all with their businesses today, um, so they couldn't be here with us today in person. Um, but they were extremely enthusiastic to do whatever it took to get their, their dog houses back. We continue to get uh, interest from store owners who want these in New York City because on a daily basis, they're encountering people who want to come inside and shop with them and they have to turn them away because they have a dog with them and they're given no solution at all. So our technology is first of its kind and providing a solution for a problem that occurs every single day for New Yorkers who own dogs and also the store owners that are having to turn them away and losing business. Thank you. And we will continue again conversation. We will continue working with my colleague, Council Member Spinal, and the central staff here and the community transportation also will be more than happy to continue conversation with you and my colleagues to see how we can work on this bill. Thank you. So the next panel.
Sack, Hatch Miller, Clyde, Vano, Bruce, and Jack Davis. If I know there's anyone who fill out your card and I didn't call you, please let her know. If not, this is the last panel. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to thank this uh, committee on uh, transportation. Uh, I'd like to thank Chairman Rodriguez, and I thank my, uh, my council member, uh, Idanique Miller. My name is Clyde Vanell. I'm the New York State Assembly member for the 33rd Assembly District. I represent the areas of uh, Cambria Heights, Queens Village, St. Albans, Hollis, Bell Rose, and Floral Park. I'm here in strong support of the Commercial Truck Abuse Act intros 1010, which increases fines for, uh, to uh, trucks from $400 to $800, respectively, for the first and second violation, and intro 1011, uh, which decreases the parking time for commercial vehicles on the streets. I'm also here because I, we have a bill in the state uh, uh, that I sponsored, Bill um, uh, A8363, which also increases the fines. This is simply about environmental justice, wealth protection, the quiet enjoyment of the property and the interference of parking to get uh, to work, school, and the hospital. Uh, Southeast Queens and Eastern, Eastern Queens sit at the feet of one of the busiest airports in the country, JFK, and we host a large import-export businesses that distribute food, materials, supplies to local businesses uh, and establishments uh, from around the world. Queens takes pride in the fact that we are able to have such a large impact on the economic growth of the, of the city. Unfortunately, hosting these businesses and the airport has put a strain on our communities. While commercial trucks have a place to pick up and drop off supplies they're delivering, there's no place for them to park. So between overnight stays, they park on residential communities taking up spaces in front of our houses, uh, not just creating an eyesore, but also an environmental hazard that is troublesome for many families. Southeast Queens is, de is designated as an extreme transit desert uh, from the federal government where it takes residents an hour and a half to get to Midtown Manhattan by public transportation. That, that's why, family, that's why fam many families rely on cars and many families have multiple cars. Many of them have no other way to get, ar uh, get around to drop off their children from, uh, from school, to run errands, and to get to and fro work. Needless to say that this becomes more and more difficult when an 18-wheeler is parked in front of their homes and truck drivers also leave their cars, uh, their trucks on overnight um, as they uh, sleep in their cars. This continues to be one of the major issues to many of our local offices and to community boards that receive complaints about, about these, uh, these trucks parked overnight. These intros will reduce this hazard, and if it becomes a law, truck drivers will think twice before parking on residential streets, and the quality of life of our residents will be enhanced. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Zach Miller, and I serve as Metro Region Vice Chair for the Trucking Association of New York. I want to thank Chairman Rodriguez and the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify to you today. For over 85 years, the Trucking Association of New York, a nonprofit trade group, has represented the industry in New York, advocating for the industry at local, state, and federal levels. We provide educational programs to our members, which enhance their safety and maintenance efforts, and offer numerous councils and committees to meet the diverse needs of our membership. Tandy comprises over 600 member companies from New York, Canada, and every border state. Uh, there are several bills being heard today, but I'd like to focus on intro 1010, 1011, and 1140. 
While it is necessary and important for drivers to take federally mandated rest periods, we do not condone drivers parking their vehicles on residential streets for multiple days. Tenney has proposed some language to intro 1011, which we've included in this testimony, clarifying that trucks show proof, such as a bill of lading, that proves they are actively engaged in business and should not be issued a fine. Many of our members need to unload large amounts of freight and other cargo from their trucks, which in some cases could exceed the proposed 90-minute time limit. It is also common that drivers may arrive at a location earlier than expected and before the business is open to receive deliveries and should not be fined for this standard practice. Furthermore, Tanny believes that there may be inadequate signage concerning commercial vehicle parking in some areas of the city and would require a deeper review of current signage before Tanny is willing to consider increased fines stated in Intro 1010. Uh, with regard to Intro 1140, Tanny has been supportive of the concept and practice of off-hour deliveries to the extent that customers can accept them. Many businesses do not have dedicated staff to accept deliveries at off hours. Recently, DOT Commissioner Polly Trottenberg pointed out that a supermarket on the Upper West Side is actually prohibited by their lease from receiving off hour deliveries. Intro 1140 recognizes that the City of New York is a large consumer and requiring them to implement an off hour delivery program in city owned buildings sets an important example for other consumers. Uh, Tanny also supports Intro 570 and tentatively supports Intro 867, which would review street widths, th um, though we would like further clarification on the intent of the bill and are happy to meet with Council Member Adams to discuss further and are happy to meet with any Council Members to discuss any of these issues further. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for convening this hearing for the chance to testify. My name is Jack Davies. I'm the Campaigns Manager at for Transportation Alternatives. I will note that my submitted testimony spells out our positions on the individual measures noticed today, but I will use my limited time to discuss parking generally. As we craft city policy governing on-street parking, it's critical that we both appreciate the context the current rules were written in and be mindful of the environment we're formulating new policy in. The laws governing parking across the city were largely devised by power broker Robert Moses during an era of peak automobile production and use in the United States. As New York radically suburbanized in the 1950s, Moses and his city planning commission prioritized cars as the principal form of future transportation. As a result, the city deeded enormous amounts of public space to drivers for private car storage to meet the perceived increase in automobility and gave no consideration to the new demands that an evolving New York would place on safety, equity, and other transportation resources like the existing transit networks. Of course, 21st century New York looks wildly different than planners in the 1960s envisioned. New York's residential population density is almost 20% higher today than in 1960. The majority of New York City households don't own cars, and public transit remains the primary way most New Yorkers travel on a day-to-day -day basis. Yet car parking requirements set by Moses over 50 years ago and more in line with a mid-sized municipality than the most transit-rich city in the country still largely govern New York, and these antiquated policies are costing New Yorkers. The majority of New York City's space is being used inefficiently. Currently, 80% of New York's open space is filled by parked cars and congested traffic, a wildly unfair allocation of space in a city where the majority of citizens do not own a car and space is a precious commodity. On-street on parking consumes 16,000 acres of public space. It's the equivalent of more than 16 central parks. Most of New York City's streets are lined with cars, and as a matter of policy, we have accepted the idea that these cars should be afforded the opportunity in one of the priciest housing markets in the nation to live rent-free, all, all the while rent increases for actual people. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bruce Kraft. I live in Queens. The area bordered by Horace Harding Expressway, Grand Central Parkway Service Road, Union Turnpike to the city line, on a Sunday morning at 10 a.m. this year, I found 58 tractor trailers. They were parked in front of people's homes, churches, schools, parks. They are waste haulers, car carriers. They park underneath highways at the Union Turnpike and Grand Central Parkway, which is dangerous. This continues all the time. Last year at this time, there were 30 parked. Now there's almost 60. They park overnight, they park by fire hydrants, they unhook their trailer, leave their trailer, take their truck. Saturday, tractor trailer was doing maintenance, had the whole front end of the truck off and was doing maintenance. Sunday, 73rd Avenue, tractor trailer, had another truck block the street while for the next three hours they repaired it. This is in front of a public park. You can go to the ball fields on 73rd Avenue and you will see 
waste haulers parked. People do not have places to park their cars in certain areas. Flushing, you go by there. Even if you Google the church, the Queensborough Community Church, and Google it, you will see, what do you see? You will see a car carrier. This has gone on long enough. They park in where people cannot get a park when they come home at night to park their car because we don't live in an area where transportation is like in Manhattan. If you don't have a car, you don't live. And you have to now drive around while a tractor trail is taking up three or four spots. Thank you. Thank you. To address those issues. Has any members of the Chalk Association uh, or you as an institution been able to work with any truck drivers who is part of the Chalk Association to address those issues that you heard from important for New York, especially with, for the resident of Queens? With the specific drivers or the company? Well, those cases, like, as you heard, like, this testimony right now, what is happening in Queens, in that part, like a truck, a driver who park his truck in that particular location and do the maintenance or leave it there for hours and hours. Like, are you as the institution that work with other members who has drivers affiliated, you know, with them, how do you work with your own membership to be sure that they also are responsible to the residents. Well, we have to get the word out to them that this is what's happening and it's unacceptable. What is it? We have to get the word out to them, to membership, that it's happening and unacceptable. I didn't know about any of the maintenance things. And um, I want to say maybe a month, maybe two months ago, we met with Council Member Miller's office, and he was the one who brought it to our attention that a lot of the problems in your district is with um, more uh, truck drivers who actually are more local residents. We were, we were under the impression that a lot of this was from out of state. Uh, it turns out a lot is from local, and what they'll do is they'll come, I think the council members said on Thursday or Friday, they'll come with the truck, and then they'll come with either their spouse or a friend in a car. They'll drop off the truck for the weekend and take the car back to where they live, which is all local. So this just was brought to our attention, I want to say, a month, two months ago. So we're trying to get the word out that this is unacceptable and you can't be doing this. The important thing is that we need to continue working together and address those concerns, which is very important for the quality of life issues of residents, or in this case of Queens, but it can be any other particular area. So let's continue conversation. Let's see how we can uh, address any specific issue and see how we can get in touch with those who own those trucks. With that, thank you. It, I would like to end saying that this hearing on parking was about updating a system that need changes on meters, commercial parking, pedestrian safety, adding to more alternative parking uh, to two very important community, the Chinese and the Asian community and the Latino community, it's about, it's about legible parking signs, animal rights, pedestrian safety. And I'm committed to continue working with my colleagues and all the advocates through the five boroughs to be sure that we take the parking system to the level that we should be, which should be more efficient to everyone. Thank you. With this, this hearing is adjourned.